turn now to the passage that we are considering today, which is from the book of Ruth. <clears throat> turn with me to Ruth chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to verse 13. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 13. We are working through a series on the book of Ruth, and we are now at Ruth chapter 2, and we'll consider this passage from verse 1 to verse 13. Ruth chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to verse 13, and it says, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. So Ruth, and Mo Mo so Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servants, to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from the morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field. Now go from here, but stay close by my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which, have, which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you do not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. This is the word of God. And this is the passage that we will be considering today. In this church plant, we believe in what's called perseverance of the saints. And we understand that dark providences are frequently used by God as a rod of discipline which breaks off the, and it slowly chips away at parts of our lives which are not pleasing to the Lord. So that we can actually say, as the psalmist did, it was good for me that I was afflicted so that I could learn your statutes. But just as we have learned from the past, in the past few weeks, dark providence has worked for our perseverance. So we also recognize that there are also bright and joyous providence that has worked for our perseverance as well. As much as dark providences are ordained by God, 
so our bright and joyous providences are also ordained by God. They are used to encourage us to look to God and to know that God is good. He cares for us and He meets our every needs. Such an example was made real to Pastor Earl Blackburn. Pastor Earl Blackburn is someone that we know and someone that we have prayed for. What happened was that he actually had a sense of fatigue some 20 years back. He had a lack of appetite. It actually led him to get some blood work done. The blood work found that he was actually anemic and hypoglycemic. The doctor actually assured him, oh, those can easily be resolved. You just need some over-the-counter tablets. Just take some iron tablets and you should be good. The doctor assured him that those can easily be resolved, no problem. But just as well, he actually had a friend who was a gastroenterologist. That friend actually decided to say, you know what, let's schedule a colonoscopy just as a precaution. By the time he went through the colonoscopy, he was under anesthesia and he woke up, he saw himself being rushed to the doctor's office where he was diagnosed with stage three cancer. Two days later, he had part of his colon removed. But then a week later, he had post-operation bacterial infection. The sepsis was so bad that it had invaded his abdominal and chest cavities. Right away, he had to have yet another surgery with a different team of doctors who so happened to be on call and available at that time. The church came together. Everyone from all over the world who knew Brother Earl prayed for him. But what came subsequently was what he had really never thought of. He ended up having ARDS, respiratory distress syndrome. His lungs started to collapse. His kidneys started to shut down. His heart stopped. The surgeons had to revive him and remove more of his colon. For 10 days, he was connected to a ventilator with tubes running through his mouth, his nose, his neck, his abdomen. The doctors told his wife, Debbie, we have done all we can, and we do not think that he will make it through the night. It is now up to him to fight on. But Debbie responded, no, sirs, it's not up to him, but it is up to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. What was supposed to be a five-day simple surgery ended up being a month-long stay in the ICU. Providentially, Brother Earl ended up coming out of it. And to this day, nearly 20 years later, he has undergone more than 15 surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, you name it. So I ask you, was this an accident? Was it an accident that his fatigue and lack of appetite <clears throat> led him to get some blood work done? Was it an accident that the gastroenterologist decided to do a colonoscopy? Was it an accident that he had such a wonderful team of surgeons just at the right time, at the right place to operate on him? It was not an accident. It was the providence of the Almighty God. God could have just taken away his life easily and saved him from all the suffering and surgeries and the chemotherapy that he had to go through. Or God could have spared him and his loved ones all the distress that they had to go through. Why not just jump straight to the end? But God, in his divine providence, works out his redemptive purpose in our lives. We need to remember that God works these purposes out so that we have a deeper trust and a higher praise to Him. Throughout His journey, through the many years of battling cancer, 
Brother Earl was able to minister the word of God to so many lost souls. He can even tell you of the healthy young USC football player who was sitting right by his side when they were undergoing chemotherapy together. How they were able to bond and share and he was able to preach the gospel to him. And God mercifully spared his life that even to this age, he's in his 70s, he has ministered to the hearts of many, including myself and my family. Oh, how I thank the Lord for his blessings that he has shown upon me through Brother Earl. My dear friends, providence does not work in a vacuum. It works through human events. It works through human decisions. It works through doctors. It works through pastors. It works through church members. God's providence works concurrently with human actions and decisions. And this is the story of Naomi and Ruth today. Naomi and Ruth had gone through dark, dark trials as we had saw, as we have seen in chapter 1. They have gone through so much. They had drunk from the bitter cup of despair. They felt the heaviness of dark providences. But then God began to break up the dark clouds. It's as though the light at the end of the tunnel begins to appear. God begins to turn a smile on his face towards Ruth and Naomi. Then God begins to show them through human actions and human decisions the glorious truth of Romans 8.28 that God indeed works all things for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. We see in this passage that true faith will be accompanied by blessing. We see this passage is divided into two sections. The first section is general providence, and the second section is special providence. What is the difference between those two? In the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 5, paragraph 7, describes, describes it as such. The providence of God, in a general way, includes all creatures, but in a special way, it takes care of his church and arranges all things to its good. You hear that? The general providence of God includes all creatures, but the special providence of God takes care of his people and his church and arranges all things for their good. So we see now the first section, the blessing of general providence. We see that the end of chapter 1, verse 22, it says there, So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. It was the beginning of barley harvest. Take note that in this verse, you see for the first time that Ruth is being identified as Ruth the Moabitess. <clears throat> Earlier in chapter 1, it was mentioned that the two sons of Naomi married Moabite women. But here in verse 22, it specifically calls out Ruth the Moabitess. Why is that important? Remember that Israel and Moab had constantly been animosity at each other. Not only during the Exodus, when the Israelites were wandering through the desert, the king of Moab prevented the Israelites from traveling through his territory. They wanted to cut through to get to the land of Canaan. But the king of Moab says no. And you also remember in the book of Numbers, there was this king, King Balak. He was a Moabite. This Moabite king hired a prophet named Balaam to curse the people of Israel. There was tremendous animosity between the Israelites and the Moabites. And here we see Ruth is specifically called out as the Moabitess. 
it serves to us as a reminder that she is an outsider. She is not a Jew. In fact, she is being looked down upon by the Jews. And in this instance, God's general providence falls upon both Jews and Gentiles. You see in chapter 1 that there was a famine in the land. But now it is the beginning of harvest. God's general providence causes the sun to shine on believers and unbelievers. God causes the rain and the snow to fall on believers as well as the unbelievers. Famine and harvest are general blessings of God to all, regardless of whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. That is God's general providence. And as the writer of this book unfolds the events that happen in the life of Ruth and Naomi, God's providence is unfolding, and we need to be aware of it. Not only is it the beginning of the barley harvest season, but there's also a relative who's going to be helping this family out. Boaz is not only a wealthy man, but he is also a man of integrity who is strong in the Lord. And as the story unfolds, you start to get a glimmer of hope for these two destitute widows. Now what happens next? Let's look at verse 2 and 3. It says there in verse 2, So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Eli Malik. It was God's general providence that regardless of whether your fa- whatever your family background is, whatever your ethnicity is, whatever your status in life is, those who are in need, they are allowed to glean in the fields for food. What does it mean to glean? In the Old Testament, there is actually a welfare system In that time, God made provisions for the poor. You see that in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9 and 10, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19. The law of gleaning was basically the welfare system of that time, where those who own land, those who own fields, those who have food to harvest, they are not allowed to glean the corners. You have to leave the corners of the field for the poor. And in Deuteronomy, it says that if you actually forget or leave a sheaf behind, you are not allowed to go back and pick it up. You are to leave it for the poor. The poor were able to come along and then glean the corners of the field or pick up whatever left over that there is. It was a system that those who had plenty were able to share with those who do not have much. As much as it is God's general providence to provide for the poor and needy, we must note here something that is called the doctrine of divine concurrence. What does that mean? It is really important for us to understand this. Concurrence with providence. What does it mean by concurrence? The doctrine of concurrence simply means that God and humans both acting and working at the same time or concurrently. It is where two or more parties can act in the same event and produce given outcomes without all parties having the same intent. God is sovereign over all things. He is not the author of evil, but he works through evil intents of others to fulfill His good intent. We see here that Ruth, she didn't waste time. She shows her humility and her respect to Naomi by asking, please let me go to the field and glean. She doesn't say, oh, if God wants me to eat, he will provide grain that I need. 
I just need to sit here and God will provide. No, instead she takes the initiative and says to her mother-in-law, I need to go out and start gleaning now. This concurrence is the teaching of providence being worked out through human actions as well as human decisions. So that at the same time we are acting, God is acting through our actions. There are many today who actually distort the doctrine of God's sovereign providence. They say if God has it all planned out and if God is truly sovereign and in control of all things, why in the world should I do anything? If God wants me to have a job, he will give me a job. I don't need to apply. If God wants me to have a wife, he will make a wife show up at my doorstep. I don't need to pursue. Or if God would want me to actually work, he will bring work to me. I don't need to go out there. Ruth, if she were to have that mentality, should have just sat down and waited for Boaz to come knocking on her door. If God didn't want Ruth to starve, he would have sent manna from heaven and dropped down. That is wrong doctrine, my friends. Understand that the passage is very clearly telling us that God uses Ruth's humility and courage to work out his plan. This is why the doctrine of God's divine sovereignty never dissuades me from acting, but instead it motivates me to act. The fact that I believe that my God in heaven, he knows the end from the beginning, doesn't turn me into a spiritual slug. Instead, it gives me great energy and motivation to step out by faith, knowing that I can take risks because my God has it all under control. The book of Ruth is telling us that God works through Ruth's humility. Her relative, Boaz, was there, not by chance, it was all in God's providence. It was the barley harvest season. Was that by chance? No. My friends, we should never ever take the wonderful and glorious doctrines of God's absolute sovereignty and providence and use them to turn us into lazy, irresponsible people. Have you heard the story of George Stott? George Stott was a British missionary in the 1800s. George Stott, when he was 19, he was working in the farm and he tripped and fell. He knocked one of his knees on the stone when he fell when he was 19 years old. That simple accident led to swelling in his leg and ultimately one of his legs had to be amputated. And George Stott, during that nine months when he laid as an invalid, the Lord graciously saved his soul. He eventually became a teacher at a school and that's when he actually heard about the missionary Hudson Taylor in China. How there were so many in China who have yet to hear the gospel of Christ and him crucified. He then made up his mind to be a missionary in China himself. When, he, when people ask him, why? Why do you actually go to missionary with only one leg? Why do you think you should go to China with one leg? And his remark was, I don't see those with two legs going, so I must. He didn't just say that if God wants people in China to be safe and if God wants people to know him, he will re reveal himself miraculously to the Chinese. George Stott understood God's providence and sovereignty and he acted. Today, George Stott is credited for laying the groundwork for the large number of Christians in Wenzhou, Zhejiang province, where about 10% of the population are actually Christians in that province in China. We need to understand that the Almighty God, who is sovereign over all the universe, works in and through us to accomplish His purpose. Then we see the divine providence of Boaz meeting Ruth. In chapter 2, verse 1, 
There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Eli Malik. His name was Boaz. It highlights here that Boaz was a wealthy man and a relative of Ruth's late father-in-law. But not only was he wealthy, we will see in verse 4 that Boaz was a godly man. Notice the greeting that Boaz gives to his workers in verse 4. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. In that greeting, we find this man of faith. He's a man who loves the Lord. He carries his relationship with God with him wherever he went. He was out visiting one of his fields and his meeting with this worker of his, he greets his workers with, may the Lord bless you. And notice how the workers respond to him. They say, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you. When have you actually greeted a colleague like that? Have you actually gone to work and say, may the Lord be with you? And did the workers respond, may the Lord bless you? It clearly shows here that Boaz was a godly man who lived a godly life regardless of whether he was at home or at work. And this is also an application to us as Christians. We should not compartmentalize our lives. We don't have one life as a Christian, whether it's at church or at home, and then another life at work. Wherever we go, wherever our lives are, regardless of our position, whether you're in authority or whether you're a subordinate, our attitude and our words should always reflect our relationship with God. This man, Boaz, is clearly a godly man. And after his greeting, notice the question that he had in verse 5. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was, in, who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? Something about this woman has captured the attention of Boaz. And we know that this is not by chance. We know that she captured his attention in the providence of God. She captured his attention because God's purpose was to be fulfilled. Notice the response of the manager of the reapers there in verse 6 and 7. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. And so the manager fills in Boaz on what has happened throughout that morning. He explains to Boaz who Ruth is, how she has come to them, how she entered them, what she's been doing all day. Fills him, fills him in on all the details that have happened. Now, what conclusion can we actually draw from verse 4 to verse 7 here? What you have here is the divine providence of God that has brought Ruth to this field. God has allowed Boaz to have his attention caught by this young woman. Was it an accident that Ruth and Naomi were actually back in Bethlehem right at the beginning of barley harvest? Was it by random chance that there was a relative of Naomi's late husband, Boaz, who happens to be wealthy and owns fields? Was it by luck that Ruth chose this particular field to glean from at this specific time when Boaz was visiting? This was certainly no accident, my friends. It was God's perfect timing that Ruth and Naomi were back in Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. That there was a kinsman, Boaz, who was there. God has them there at the same time, in the same place, because he has an appointment that was set for them before the foundation of the world. I want to ask you tonight, or today, this morning, 
Think about your own life. Have you ever stopped and think about the divine providences that has happened in your life? The way that God has put some events together in your life that there's no way that you could have planned it out the way it happened. There's no way that anyone could have mapped it out the way it turned out. There's no way you could have brought them into pass in the way that it actually transpired. But God just worked in His mighty providence, putting you in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people, getting the right job. Think about your salvation. Think about how you came to hear of the gospel. Think about who was it that shared the gospel with you and how you came to really understand who Jesus Christ is and how Christ became your Redeemer. Do you see that your salvation was by divine providence? Think about you being here today. Is it by chance that you are hearing this message? Is it by chance that this Reformed Baptist Church plant is meeting right here in the heart of Cambridge? God, in His providence, works not only in circumstances, but He works through our thoughts, He works through our motives, He works through our intentions, He works through our action to bring about His ultimate purpose. Now we come to the second section where we see the blessing of special providence. Remember that the general providence of God reaches to all creatures, and the special providence of God takes care of His church for His children and governs all things to the good of His church. When you study Boaz as the kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth, you get some idea of the relationship that Jesus Christ has with His church. And when you look at Ruth in this book, you get some idea of the relationship that the church has towards the kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us dive in and take a look at what that actually means. The first thing we see here is Boaz reaching out and talking to Ruth in verse 8 and 9. It says that, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field nor go from here, but stay close by, my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Ruth has caught the attention of Boaz. He has heard about her. Now he's going to make a choice. He's going to make a decision. Boaz is going to make a decision to take special notice of Ruth. Out of the many women who are gleaning in his field, he makes the decision to involve himself in Ruth's life, in her circumstances. This is a picture of God's grace towards us, my friends. In a way that Boaz takes interest in Ruth this way, God takes interest in our life. We did not choose God, but it was God who chose us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 tells us, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Ruth was poor. She was destitute. She's on the lowest rung of the social ladder. She deserves nothing. She has no claim on anything or anyone. And she's not expecting anything. 
Right, you remember in uh, chapter 2, verse, verse 1, where she actually, sorry, chapter 2, verse 2, where she actually tells Naomi, her mother-in-law, she says that, can I go glean so that I may find favor in someone else? She deserves nothing. And her only hope, as she put it, is for someone to show her favor. Her only hope is for someone to show her grace. She has nothing. And in this picture, we are reminded of how lost sinners come to find grace in Jesus Christ. It is by grace shown through, shown to undeserving sinners like us. Every one of us were born into this world in a state of spiritual destitute. All of us had nothing. We were dead in our trespasses. We could not save ourselves, however hard we try, however much good deeds we try to do. We will never earn our way to heaven. But as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Christ Jesus came to this world to take on human nature, to die for the sins of his people, not because his people deserves it, but because of the free grace and the mercy that he has shown upon us, that he died for us, that our sins may be counted as his when he died on the cross, and his righteousness may be counted as ours. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Colossians 1, 21 describes it this way. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. God took the initiative towards us. We had nothing that we could expect. We don't deserve anything. Our only hope was the grace of God that would be shown freely towards us. God freely gave the provision of salvation to us. Our salvation from the first to the last day is the grace of God. He is the one who preserves our salvation. He is the one who will present us one day faultless and spotless before the mighty God. He was the one who initiated it. He was the one who brought it into being. He will culminate it. It is all God's doing. Nothing in us that we did. Nothing in us that we deserve. And Boaz, here in this picture, took that initiative here towards Ruth. It wasn't Ruth who actually go and talk to Boaz. In fact, she kept quiet until Boaz spoke to her. John 15, 16, Jesus said this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Can you see yourself here in Ruth? Can you see yourself in that place of total destitution? Nothing to offer. The only ones whose favor you must have in order to survive is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God took the initiative to reach out to us, to call us by saying, Come, come, you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what God did in his saving grace. And that is what Boaz is doing here to Ruth. Something else that we see here in this picture of salvation, look at verse 10. 
it says, so she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? I am a foreigner, Ruth says. I am an outsider who does not deserve anything. We see here the, responses, the response of Ruth is a reflection of those who are truly saved by grace. Why, God, why have you chosen me? Why have you saved me, an undeserving sinner? Why do I deserve my sins to be paid for by the death of Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son of the Father? Why, God? Why have you granted me salvation and not my brother, not my sister, not my father, not my mother, not my friends? Salvation is a result of effectual calling where God opens the heart of a sinner and speaks to the heart of a sinner and draws that sinner to him. We can even see that these kind words of Boaz is very much spoken to our hearts. When the Lord saved us, he spoke gracious and merciful words, words of hope, words of redemption, words of forgiveness, words of salvation to our hearts. Not that there was a revelation from heaven that came and speak to our ears, but through scriptures, through the divine providence of someone somewhere in our life shared the gospel with us, that we bowed our knee and trusted and have faith in Christ alone. That is why believers in the New Testament are often referred to as the call of God. We receive not only an external call through the preaching of the gospel, but the reason why we are saved is that there was an internal call from the preaching of the gospel. There was an internal call that dealt with our hearts, that showed us how incapable and destitute we are that we have no hope but only to cling to the cross of Calvary. Christ Jesus spoke to our hearts with kind words. That's how he saved us. Romans 1.5, it says, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. You are the called. Romans 8.30 And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Your Savior initiated the relationship with you. Your Savior called you. He spoke kindly to your heart. And if you are truly saved, you would have a response just like Ruth. You would have fallen on your face and cry out to him, Why, Lord, why me? Why have you shown mercy on me, an undeserving sinner? Who am I that you should take notice of me? Who am I that the sovereign God would speak to my heart and show me that I am lost and show me the way of salvation is through His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see how Boaz shows grace towards Ruth and it was so overwhelming. And so also when we realize how God has shown mercy towards us, our hearts are humble. Our hearts is as though it wants to bow down to him and worship him in thanksgiving, saying, oh Lord, thank you for saving me, for choosing me, for blessing me, not because of anything that I deserve. I am totally unworthy of your goodness and your grace but yet you have chosen me and taken notice of me. The third point we notice here, Boaz promises to protect Ruth and to provide for her. 
Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink with the young men who have drawn it. Then in verse 11 and 12, you see Boaz blessing Ruth. He blesses Ruth for her good deeds and faith. Verse 11, it says, And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and you have come to the people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel whose whose wings under which you have come for refuge. Boaz says, I will provide for you. I will protect you. He's going to treat her like a member of his family. And in the same way, we can think and reflect on the fact that God has adopted us into his family. He has made us his own children. He takes the foreigner. He takes someone who is not part of his family, someone who is not holy, someone who is destitute, someone who is not deserving of anything, someone who is completely foreign to his holiness. He takes that foreigner and he makes them his child just like Boaz promises to protect and provide for Ruth, so does God do so for the sinners. He brings us into a place of protection where we are eternally safe from the wrath and the punishment of God upon sin. We deserve to be damned to hell. We deserve God's holy and righteous wrath to be poured upon us. But yet, through his grace, through his mercy, the Lord Jesus has adopted us and put us in a place where any of the enemies that Satan cannot touch us anymore. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Oh friends, do you not see God's goodness in our life? Christ has taken us into a place of protection. He is the bread of life. He is the living water to us. When we are thirsty, we drink from Him. When we are hungry, He is our bread. He meets our every need, whether it is in the physical or the spiritual realm. And finally, we see comfort to the soul. In verse 13, it says, Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord. For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. What did Ruth do? She does three very simple things in that response that she gave. She accepts his favor. She acknowledges his kindness. And she acknowledges her unworthiness. She simply believes in him. She speaks from her heart that she believes in him. And that is what happens in salvation, my dear friends. We simply hold on to Christ and him crucified. We believe in God. We hear the good news that though we are sinners, though we are deserving of his wrath, though we are fully deserving of judgment and damnation, but he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
when we heard that gospel, that good news of Christ and Him crucified, it reached our hearts and we believed in Him. We had faith in Him. That good news spoke to our heart and the effectual call of God came to us and we simply just trusted in Him. We accepted His favor. We thanked Him for His kindness, all the while recognizing our unworthiness. And when we have faith like Ruth, God's promises will be a comfort to us. He is a God of refuge. He will never break His promises. Throughout history, you have seen time and time again, God's promises come through. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in John chapter 6, verse 35 and 37, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Oh, what a privilege it is to be a believer of Christ, to be part of his family, to be adopted into his family, even though we are so undeserving. So in summary, we have covered two sections today. The blessing of general providence. What are they? There was the beginning of harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest. There was the poor who were able to glean after the reapers where God provides. And then there was Boaz meeting Ruth. Then in the second section, there was the blessing of special providence, where we saw grace being shown to the undeserving and that there was that effectual calling, the blessing of protection and provision, and the comfort to the soul. So as we draw to a close today, can we not see that true faith will be accompanied by blessing? God has guided you by His providence to hear this message today. You may either be a believer who recognizes his unworthiness, or you can be an unbeliever who is still searching. Let these words be your words. Will your response to the gospel be like that of Ruth? Or will you be like her sister-in-law Orpah, which we saw last week, who returned to her old ways? If you are a believer, you will take comfort in Romans 8.28 that all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who are the call according to His purpose. God's special providence works to strengthen and comfort God's people. Under whatever circumstances that we may be in, know that our Father in heaven loves us. He has given us His only begotten Son. Will He withhold anything good from us when He has already given us His only begotten Son? And now we are called His children. We are able to call Him as our Father. He will not withhold anything from us. And may God be blessed forevermore.